Hello and welcome again to this edition of Phi TV. I'm your host, Brad Swanson. We are coming to you, as usual, just a few blocks from Florida's capital. Uh, today, we have Peter Schorsch with Florida Politics coming into us remotely. Peter, welcome to the show. Brad, this is great. I wish I could see you, but this will have to do. It always, right? We'll, we'll figure it out after the, uh, the craziness uh, lets down. Um, but we've got you on for your amazing expertise and insights on uh, the Florida elections. And uh, we'd love to uh, start off by uh, rocking through a, a 2020 election uh, preview. And I think the first one is, is as Florida's gearing up uh, for the general election in November, what's the big themes you're seeing? Well, I don't know if this uh, is going to come as a surprise to many people, but the presidential election in Florida is going to be close. Um, the presidential? Crazy. <laughs> okay. In fact, it's, it seems to be a battle amongst journalists on how to rewrite the same story again and again, that Florida is going to be deadlocked. What I will surprise you with, and I'm going to say this, I'm going to date it right now, September 9th. Um, I do subscribe to the belief that the race is not close, at least not nationally. I think it is close in Florida, yeah. but I do not think the presidential race, as it stands today, is close. I, I pegged Joe Biden at about seven or eight points on Donald Trump. Um, I think he's got the blue wall in place, which is Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. And I think it's indicative uh, of Biden being able to play offense that he has got Trump pinned down in Florida. So much so that we saw the president come to Florida to make an environmental uh, message announcement uh, on behalf of the White House. I think that Trump, I mean, Trump and everyone knows he has to win Florida uh, to even get close to winning the uh, right amount of electoral votes. And so I don't, as much as I, everybody wants to say it's close, I'm going to buy into that argument that it's not. And I think, I think right now it could be an early election night. I think Florida could come hmm. in for two or three points for Joe Biden. As soon as Florida pops up, I think you'll see the rest of the Midwest go that way. And whereas everyone thinks that this vote is going to be uh, is going to take weeks to resolve itself, I think that there is a good one in three chance that we could be in bed by 11, 30, 12 o'clock. So you think this year, because the, you think the election, A, goes to Biden, B, it's going to be an early election night, people could actually go back to having an election night cocktail party and after, after the results come in. I mean, I know a lot of people are rejoicing with that kind of uh, prognostication, but uh, you know, it used to be the results were coming in so fast that it, the party was done before it even got started. So I, remember well, those I know uh, many politicos will rejoice with that, that, that prediction. I remember those days well. And in fact, during the primary, um, it was a little odd I was basically done by 11 o'clock. There were a few races in South Florida, some house races that still had to resolve themselves. Mm -hmm. But by and large, and we covered over 100 different races up and down the ballot, um, you know, because of the, the change in the rules that allows SOEs to count the votes, you know, uh, early votes before, you know, right up until 7 o'clock, um, you know, they, mm -hmm. can, they can pop it right there at 7.05 with... Um, early vote totals, and some counties did that. You know, Pasco, Pinellas, Orange right. County, they pop those numbers early, and you get a sense of what's going on. Miami Dade, on the other well, hand, they're, they're still working on Miami Dade time. Let me, let me ask you a question uh, before we get off the uh, national election. Um, in previous elections, people point to voter enthusiasm. They, they certainly did it in 2016 as a potential reason that was, was you know, against the polls. Um, how do you rate Biden's, the enthusiasm of Biden's voters versus the Trump voters and, and, and kind of how a, a, an undecided voter could look for that? You know, if you go by uh, this past Labor Day weekend by the flotillas you see going by my house and other waterfront homes in Florida, you would think that Donald Trump is well on his way to a Ronald Reagan 1984 uh, re-election. Um, let me shoot down one argument, you know, let me set up an argument and shoot it down to kind of prove where I think I'm coming from. Democrats did very well. Uh, they actually outperformed Republicans in the primaries in the gross total of the amount of um, early and mail-in ballots that had been cast. There are some people on the Republican side uh, who poo-pooed that. There was a Politico article 
a, a big name A list pollster was saying, nah, you know what? There were more competitive races on the Democratic side, and that's in and in Democratic counties, and that's why you saw more uh, Democratic ballots being cast, especially early. I think it was the opposite of that. If you look, if you run down the list like we do, uh, congressional races in in Gainesville, St. Petersburg, uh, Southwest Florida, uh, Polk County. If you look at the big state Senate race, it was in Southwest Florida, and in almost all of the House races, those were GOP primaries. There was there was definitely some competition in Broward County, but there's always competition in Democratic Broward County. So I looked right. at it like. There was a lot of Republican action, and yet Democrats still outperformed them. There were Republican primaries in the panhandle, which rarely happens, and they and Democrats still outperformed them in terms of overall voter uh, votes being cast. So I look at that. I look at the body on the floor and say, that's the enthusiasm that you see for Democrats. They were voting in primaries, and they were voting by, by mail in primaries, which are two phenomenons that they did not do as well as Republicans in elections past. Yeah, the turnout has been the key for the Republicans in elections past and and with that democratic turnout if that trend holds, I think I think uh, you know, your 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 predictions will be well served. I mean, they're always well served, but uh, that's an interesting piece that people should pay attention to. Okay, so we're so moving off of the presidential at least for for now. Sure. Um, let's talk about what is definitely pervasive in, in your reporting and your echoing of other outlets reporting. How is the pandemic um, impacting this election st- uh, cycle? And frankly, how is it impacting your, 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 um, your publications and your blogging and everything? That's a good question. Um, you know, n- number one, it's impacting the fundraising. Um, you know, people will look for any mm, reason not to one. give. People will look for any reason not to give to candidates. And if the reason is they are legitimately out of work or they are legitimately worried about the economic future, they're going to put their wallets away. So other than the big national like Biden campaign, uh, you're you're seeing a lot of the individual donors. Uh, those checks are not being written. Now, the institutional money, the corporations and the political committees, they're still raising uh, big money. And in fact, what, if anything has happened, the pandemic has made the reliable institutional donor, somebody that can write a $25,000 check from the uh, from the from a corporation which is permitted in Florida, um, that is happening a lot more, and it's making people even more dependent on that. Whereas congressional races, which are dependent, you can't take money from corporations; you can only do it from PACs and individuals. It's making fundraising a little bit more difficult on that side, um, and so that would be the number one thing. As far as our reporting has gone, you know, I don't want to say it's easier by any means because it's not. One of the things is every reporter now is a pandemic reporter. So every political story is written through the guise of what's going on. Certain places are hot spots. Certain places are not hot spots. Like it's not impacting races in the panhandle and and north of Orlando for the most part. Um, But every story that we write usually gets told through how it's how the pandemic is impacting people. Are there a lot of unemployed people in their district, et cetera? Um, but one of the things for us from a meta level, how we conduct our reporting, it actually has been, you know, for a digital first newsroom like ours and a newsroom that doesn't exist except on the Slack channel, you know, we were built for this years ago. And so while right. some people, you know, the Orlando Sentinel is moving out of its newspaper or out of its building, we never had a building to move out of. So we were ready for this. And so we know how to, we know how to cover things remotely. We know how to... <laughs> you know, we know how to set up Zoom channels and Prezi and right. all of those things. And so, I don't know, this has been, this is kind of in our wheelhouse, uh, probably more so than a legacy reporter who will, you know, one of the things for us is we like to cover a lot of things um, and not get bogged down in like one rally for the day and get one story. Um, and so that's really, right. there's been a lot of advantages for us. Yeah, the content is is not short, not short, and I know for those of us that read and burn religiously every morning, um, I mean it's a lot longer than it was last year and the year before and the year before that. And the content is on point from not only your reporters, from from the other um, folks that you guys source on every topic that somebody could could want to want to want to look up. So that's, I mean, 
That's interesting that, that you guys are, it's, I mean, it sounds like you're flourishing, frankly, in this environment. So, um, I, okay, so let, let, let me move on to what is uh, one uh, item that, that people on both sides love to follow and be hysterical about one way or the other, polling. So the trends in Florida, um, let's talk about, you know, what are you seeing that's different this cycle versus 2016 um, on polling? I think one of the the things that people have got to remember about polling, like your mom's got a recipe for chicken parmesan and my mom's got a recipe for chicken parmesan, but that doesn't mean that our mother's recipes are going to taste the same, right? Right. You know, there are pollsters. Yesterday, the NBC News poll came out and showed the race tied. All right. Is the race tied? I I can't say whether it is or not, but I look at the sample size that it forecasts will be there in 20 at the end of November or the end of the race. And it says that Republicans will have a three point turnout advantage over Democrats, the rest being independents at the end of the day when all the ballots are counted. Um, And that has the race. And with that with that framework, the race is tied. Now, I would say to you, 2016, when Donald Trump won and did well in Florida, the GOP turnout was only one point five more than Democrat. It really, it really, may, I'm, I find it hard to believe that the GOP, and that's, this isn't like uh, there's the undiscovered voter and everything like that. I think it would be, it's very hard to right. believe. I don't think anybody believes that Republicans are going to outperform Democrats by three percentage points in terms of turnout. That doesn't mean that Trump won't still win. It just means we don't think that that many more Republicans will turn out the Democrats. And so if you adjust those numbers then I think you get a whole different set of numbers. And so I think everybody's got to remember when they're looking at polls, they've got to look at what that particular pollster is forecasting for a model. That's why big brand name pollsters like Quinnipiac often get it wrong. You know, they have these turnout models that so favor Democrats that they're not believable. Mm -hmm. It's not even that they're not contacting the right people. It's that they think that more like Democrats are going to turn out by thousands more than Republicans. I just don't believe those things are going to happen. So that's one big thing. Right. I think another thing that we are, um, that we're prepared for now is, all right, so in 2016, Trump runs, he has people turn out for him that had never voted. Well, those people voted in 2016. So now we know who some of them are. Um, and they right. are able to be surveyed. They may lie. They may manipulate polling, polling as much as anybody else does. But at least we know who those people are. Those first-time voters for Trump, we now have a little bit of a history on it. I don't. I don't know. I don't know that there are as many first-time voters for Trump or Biden um, this time around, other than people who are registering to vote, and we obviously can track them. The idea that there is this swath of voters. I just we're we're running out of time. Okay, sorry, sorry, Brad. Sorry. No, it's 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 fascinating because the reading of the tea leaves sounds like it's going to be back to more science this year than it is art on the polling. So that's that's fascinating to hear. Um, Last question, ten seconds. Uh, We see a lot more women running for Congress uh, this year. Is this the year of of the, the female candidate? Do you think? I think it's the year of the female voter. I, I'll put it that way. I think female at the voter. end of the day, suburban mom is going to be uh, the hero for one of these campaigns one way or the other. Yeah, interesting, interesting. Well, Peter, as always, your insights are amazing. They're, they're fully uh, rounded out and thoughtful and uh, very insightful. And that's why everybody turns to burn first thing in the morning. And uh, we appreciate your friendship to FIT and FI TV. And uh, we appreciate you for coming on and we look forward to having you on again soon to, to get the next iteration of your insights. Thank you, Mr. Swanson. It's good to talk to you. All right, Peter, good talking to you, too. That's all the time we have for today's episode of Fi TV. For more in-depth interviews like this one, make sure you hit us up on our Facebook, Twitter, and our social media feeds. And for now, thanks for tuning in.